The art of experimental design uh, developed in the agricultural sciences, as most of this audience will likely know. And, um, and it took about, it wasn't until World War II finished that the, those arts were extended into the industrial arena. And uh, a very famous statistician, George Box, is largely responsible for a creation of a whole new class of experimental designs called response surface designs which added a wonderful geometric overtone to the analysis and interpretation of experimental work. And then there's the work on factorials and fractional factorial designs uh, uh, during that period. Once again, with important industrial applications for screening experiments and for simple multiple comparison experiments. So that work all proceeded through the 50s and 60s. Not that the field fell fallow, I don't mean it suggests that, but the, the big burst of activity, the sort of um, opening of a new frontier in experimental design, pretty much started uh, at the conclusion of World War II with the work of men like uh, George Box uh, and Oscar Kempthorne, I suppose, and uh, Jack Uden and people of that kind, Cuthbert Daniel, a whole bunch of folks involved. And then, of course, the, the, the subject expands in detail. Uh, people fill in, little, fill in little bits and pieces here and there. It isn't until, well, about 10 years ago, only, well, 97, 96, something like that, uh, that the next uh, frontier begins to, beca begins to open up. And that's because of the use of the computer. The classical experimental designs were constructed in the day where orthogonality and balance were of great importance. And orthogon these attributes of experimental design were important because they minimized the, the amount of computation required in the analysis of the results. The new designs are, are available because of the computer, and um, they're really remarkable. And just most recently, the, um, I suppose you want to plonk some names down against the newest designs, it'd be Brad Jones and um, Peter Goose and uh, Chris Knockstein deserve particular. But what happens now is when you complete an experimental design, you may find that you want to explore a bit more in that in a particular arena, and you need a few additional points. You don't want to repeat the experimental design or repeat a similar experimental design. You need a few elucidating points. The experimental design may have left you with various factors in the model which are confounded or aliased. There's a confusion as to which of these several models might be most appropriate. And your trick is to separate these models so you can use the, the best model for forecasting. And the trick is, how do you do that economically? And there's a lot of hard work begun there. And it was hard because the computations are tremendous. There are myriad ways in which you can augment an experimental design. And every time you augment the design in a non-orthogonal non fashion, the computational burden is tremendously increased. But then, of course, by how old we have the computer. And so the trick was to somehow or other reorganize the methodology for constructing experimental designs. And in the process of that, we became aware of another ability we had because of the computer. When you sit down with an experimenter, um, he has various constraints on what he can do in the experiment. There are things called blocking factors. Maybe the blocking factors cannot be made of all equal size. Or we may have to do what's called split plotting in this experiment, run some on one side and one on another side of a particular factor. So there are all these you need constraints. Sometimes you can't mix or get all the levels of the factors you want. You, you cannot get up to that point on the experimental design. You can get part way, but not all the way. So the design space is constrained. So constrained design space, restrictions on the factors, and restrictions on the number of runs, and restrictions on the f f blocks, and so all these myriad things come up when you try to apply an experimental design in a practical situation. Historically, uh, the statistician would say, no, no, we, we, we must have those 16 points. We wish to construct this design. And more or less, we, um, 
well, I, there's a story someplace about where the guy fits the fits the person to the, you know, he, his arms are too long, so they chop off his arms, sort of thing. That's the sort of thing we were we were adapting. We were forcing the experiment to f match the design. Now, by golly, because we can design as we please with the computer, we can match the design to the problem, which is a big difference. But that's very recent. And uh, we have Brad Jones principally responsible for that. What is needed here are software programs which will construct such experimental designs. And given the output from the, those experimental designs, can quickly do the analysis and provide the results. So that's the revolution which has come on, and it's going to completely change the way we teach experimental design. People still have to learn the language of blocking and multiple comparisons and the Pareto principle for screening and the various technical terms, interval, sta interval statements and things of that sort. However, the, um, the actual designs we will use will often be quite different. Let me back up a bit and make another point. Very often when the machine, the computer, constructs the optimum experimental design, three guesses what happens. You come right back to one of our, one of our regular designs. So if the space is large enough, if the constraints are not too strenuous, behold, we end up really reinventing a historical design. So this business of finding the optimal experimental design is really, really wonderful. And, um, and it's, the, it's, the real, it's the real change that's taking place right now in experimental design.